this. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's freaking awesome to see everyone sitting here. For those that I know, which a lot of you over the past 21 years, I think I've been a member of the RCA, and, um, and some of my best friends, certainly a lot of my clients, a lot of my colleagues come from this organization, so I'm truly, truly honored to be standing here in front of you. I take this seriously, like, oh my goodness, you're listening to me, it's pretty, uh, it's an honor. So let's talk about what we're gonna do today. You read what was on the website, you saw what was there, and I'm like, okay, now I need to deliver on that expectation. But that's a, a virtual tour through Asia is, a, a, there's a lot of countries there, right? Um, so to kind of narrow it down, all those countries into one presentation is tough. So what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna use meatballs and dumplings as the lens for us to look through to talk about how food is formed, how it evolves, its functionality, and how it morphs as it moves from country to country, from the street into a restaurant, from the restaurant into 7-Eleven, and so on. And um, so form, function, and flavor, tasting a diversity of those meatballs. So let's start off with, with this. If you think about everybody from different cuisines, different cultures, whether it be a recipe or cuisine, think for a moment how that food came together, how it was formulated, what influences there were, what influences there weren't. One simple example, let's say Thailand's a great example of, of across Asia, where it's the only place in Southeast Asia that hasn't been colonized. That impacted their cuisine in drastic ways, right? Um, we look at the environment. Physically, when we're cooking, and when we're eating it, that impacts how we serve it, how we cut it, how we prepare it. Uh, moving into that sense of time, looking to the past, I mean, it's why we're here, it's why we travel, and frankly, you are engaging in the present to create the future food around the globe, which is a pretty powerful thing. I think that's something he mentioned this morning, which is something I took from that talk, just how, how this room of individuals and the other rooms have a lot of power and I mean that in, in a sincere way that we need to be careful with because what we say, what we do, what we create, what we talk about, what we write about changes the world in which we live in. And that's a huge responsibility. Um, so then you get, to the, you get to the recipe and you think about it, I would argue that any recipe can be broken up into the ingredients, the techniques that you use, the presentation, and how those come together into ways that we eat, eat that. So let's talk about I figured what can I do for this session that's relevant to a global experience in R&D, in cultural studies, and meatballs seemed like something that's a global experience. And you think about dumplings is another one of those global formats, global forms that have different functions. Could be a snack, could be something like yum cha, drink tea and eat dim sum. I mean, everywhere around the world, uh, and this comes from uh, Gastro Obscure, I didn't take these photos, uh, has some type of dumpling. So let me ask you as an audience, what's a dumpling in your mind? I heard wrapper, I heard dough filled with something else. Steamed. Steamed, could be, could be fried, could be, who's had grilled dumplings? Wow, missed opportunity, huh? We'll talk about grilled dumplings. Okay, so then there's some things like Shanghai soup dumpling, Shaolong Bao, which is absolutely both of them simultaneously. You've got a meatball in the middle. You've got a dumpling around it. It's, I think, the epitome of an example. And I was just, I just came back from a month in uh, Malaysia, where my wife and I have a home over there. And I was in Hong Kong in, Jan in December for Christmas with the Lee Kim Kiti going around eating. And how many people have eaten at Din Tai Fung? Really, that's all? Okay, so maybe, so Din Tai Fung, great story. That QR code brings you to that book. Canton Restaurant to Panda Express. Um, as as uh, Chef mentioned, I just started, goodness, three semester ago, my uh, master's at BU, as we have Mike as a graduate of the program, so I'm following in his footsteps. And we read this book, and oh my goodness, hearing the story of how the first restaurant opened in, in uh, upscale Chinese restaurant in San Francisco, and then you had Cecilia Chang and her son Philip open up there that restaurant, then the Mandarin, then they opened something called P.F. Chang's with Paul Muller, and then how the Chung family developed Panda Express. It's that whole story. And it was amazing reading it because I was working with these folks as a lot of this was being written. I had no idea the backstory behind it. But what's interesting in there about Din Tai Fung 
right, which started in Taiwan, came to America and got really popular and then went back to Shanghai and now is one of the leading brands in Shanghai where the original food came from. Just showing that the evolution of food can happen from anywhere. The commercialization can happen, of course, in America. But it's a great book to read. And over on the right are some ones I just found this place in Hong Kong, Dim Sum Library, that had four different versions of it. Um, I thought on the bottom was an interesting, um, just from a culinary perspective, using a piece of daikon cut in the bottom to hold it. You'll see a lot of restaurants are putting them in little cups and so on. But we'll talk more about that in a moment. So we start with ingredients. Right? That's where it all begins, whether it be a sauce to season something to dip, the protein that we're using, the produce that we use for texture. We transform those ingredients through manipulating them, whether it be with machines, with our hands, <laughs> with our mouths. But we, con we just convert these into different components. And then what we do as operators and CPG manufacturers right, is assemble those into builds or menu items. So that's kind of the lens we'll go through as we're talking about the different form, functionality as they come together at each stage of this process. Last year, um, and I can share that later, I did a whole presentation here at the RCA, was it last year? Uh, the business of flavor the year prior, two years ago, thank you, um, about that whole thing. So what is the first I had to get my head around? I'm going to talk about dumplings. I knew it was the subject. I knew meatballs were part of it. But really, how do you get your head around, not from just a personal experience, but more from an analytical um, point of view, what is a dumpling or meatball? And so if you think about it, we have the primary filling, right? I mean, that's the beginning of it. No different than maybe a burger of a sort, right? Something that has something that's an amalgam, a matrix, something that's together. So you have that primary thing. And is it land, air, or water? Meaning, where does it come from if it's an animal protein? Right, pretty straightforward. Produce, aromatics, and vegetables, cabbage to add texture, jicama. You're going to have a tasting a little while of this Vietnamese meatball I made for you a couple days ago, and you'll see it has the jicama in it for that texture. Then the seasonings, whether it be something fermented, really common, right? A soy sauce, an oyster sauce, a chili sauce, add it on the inside. But then as we move down, you might use it on the outside. And I think something really important that I've learned a lot over the years is about the texture experience with dumplings is probably one of the most defining things of a dumpling from a region, right? You say, well, this is how it's made. Think about pot stickers, right? How many people had some type of pot sticker, something that's been browned and so on, right? And if you think about just anecdotally, the pot stickers you've had that were maybe in a Chinese restaurant or some derivative of that, which often have a bounce tomb that's a solid meat form, et cetera, where a gyoza, right, from Japan is almost always loose, right? It's, there's not, it's not formed, it's not bouncy, and those are signifying really signature textural attributes that you want to deliver on to deliver that, that real, um, dare I say, authentic, that genuine flavor experience of what people may expect. On the other hand, as we'll talk about today, sometimes it just doesn't matter. Let's be honest, you're serving a dumpling, it's at Costco, it's from blank brand, it tastes good. I don't think people are going to be calling you out that the gyoza filling is too bound. But sometimes it's good to understand that, right? And so this is what I was looking at, is trying to figure out what they are and how you get that bounce, like baking soda in a marinade, just like the shrimp and beef and pork you've had at every Chinese restaurant, right? Baking soda just tenderizes it. Then you go into the internal, and I'll talk about whether it's really important. Is it distributed among or is it center? And I found some really interesting dumplings that I'll show you. So you have a meatball. Well, it becomes a dumpling once it gets encased, right? Pretty straightforward. I know it's an oversimplification, but often when you wrap meat with dough, it becomes a dumpling. Maybe that's a better way of saying it. Um, and is it a dough or is it a protein? I know dough has protein in it, and I'll get to that in a moment. This crowd is a little too smart to make generalizations. <laughs> OK, so let's go to Hong Kong in, in December together, right? So I look back to this, and a few things I'd like to share with you. One is, and this is just that local dim sum, went with my friend's mom, just old school, just regular dim sum place. And there's a morel perched on top of this meatball, which had this ridiculous bounce to it. It was obviously like kind of the old school slapping it or beating that, right? It had some tenderized it added to it. So it had this bounce to it, had this chewy morel on top, and then at table side, they had this cabbage in the bottom, and they poured a vinegar-soy mixture into it. 
I'd never seen that before. Well, all the dumplings in my life, I've never seen that kind of deliberate separation of textural experiences, acid, sour, salty, umami, just in an old school dumpling, right? Just a little bit of effort. The one in the middle, what that brings up is the pork and taro meatballs, where they're starting, I'm seeing a lot more, and we're gonna taste one today with pumpkin, how reducing the animal protein through infusing other types of vegetables and other produce, et cetera. So you can really bulk that up. I recently did a Vietnamese salad roll thing at UMass, and uh, I replaced the filling, what, 25% walnuts for the meat, and it was great. It, was, it wasn't just about reducing meat, it was about adding texture. So it's not necessarily taking something away, but deliberately adding something that tastes good. And the last one, fish balls stuffed with shrimp roe. You're gonna taste a version of that today um, that I brought back from Malaysia for you that has fish roe in it. It's been frozen, everything's, it's, I've, I've taken care of it, I promise on every level I've done what I need to as a professional. So fish balls, are fish balls meatballs? Yes, why yes? It's protein, it formed into a rubber ball. So she loves fish balls, how she's describing them. Yeah, I mean, if you look at it, if you think about it from a taxonomy perspective, right? We look at being part of the animal kingdom fish. It's one of the five kingdoms on the planet. I guess it's meat. However, <laughs> philosophically, fish are often put in a different category than land animals, correct? They start saying, well, are they more sentient than this? I'm, I like fishing, right? Oh, they can't feel pain. Well, I don't know, you're pulling a hook out of a fish. They don't seem to enjoy it. Uh, so, but are they, are, they, uh, are they at the same level as other animals? Then you get into uh, the cultural and religious point of view. Think about this, Lent. Lent is Friday, right? You don't eat meat, but you can eat fish. Wait, wait, oh, I guess maybe it isn't meat. I mean, if the Catholic Church says that. Then you look at the Jewish right, religion and kosher, you can't eat meat with dairy, but fish is okay. So is it a meatball? Just something to mess in your mind a little bit. And then dietary pescatarian, right? Does that really, is that even a thing? So you are gonna have, <laughs> some people do it. I just, I love pork, I can't do without it. Ever. Um, so in the back, they're assembling different plates. Each one you has a plate. Sorry, it's on your lap. That's how it is. I had to change the whole presentation to make sure we could do that. But I had to bring in some food to taste. So that is coming out, but don't eat it until I guide you through it, please. We have three different sauces. We got three different pump. We got three different fish balls and a Vietnamese um, ball of a sort. And I'll talk about that in a moment. So let's go back to the meatballs and how like many things, like soy sauce started in China and then migrated to the rest of East Asia, right, into Japan and Korea, then moved down into Southeast Asia. So let's follow that journey with some meatballs. Remember, don't eat this stuff yet. So first thing is talking about chicken meatballs. Who's had grilled, yeah, pass them down, help. Yes, sharing is caring. Share it, please. Um, so grilled meatballs, right? Yum. Skewered meatballs. Selling 7-Eleven right across Thailand. It makes complete sense. Um, really delicious. And then this one I just had. It wasn't in Japan, actually, but it was Japanese style in Hong Kong. And I thought this was an interesting one of the peppers being, you know, on top of the, the um, pepper. Different than a shrimp toast or something you see in Chinese where it often be adhered to it and cooked. So they kept it separate deliberately. Wow, sorry, you have to hold that for a few. I'll, I'll, I'll move ahead so we can get to the tasting in a moment. So, um, old school Vietnamese, how many people have had pho? Right, I mean, yum. And that is the one with the meatballs in it. Describe those meatballs for me. One word would be? Spongy. Bouncy. Do they have much flavor? More seasoning, should I say, much taste. Mild, right? Fish sauce, black pepper, some starch, and that's it. Pretty straightforward. And notice to the left of it, what are those two sauces? Hoisin and sriracha, right? So a Chinese sauce and a Thai sauce served with the Vietnamese soup, right? Makes sense. Well, 
there's soybean sauce. And in northern uh, Vietnam, when you eat pho, there is a soybean sauce, and it's similar to hoisin. And the sriracha is similar to tung ut, which is the Vietnamese chili sauce. Close enough. But my point is, the design of that dish, and when I say design, Maybe I should say evolution, how it's changed over time. I don't think 300 plus years ago they were thinking, how are we going to serve the sauce on the side to make sure we elevate this textural experience? So like, Shit, this meatball is bland. I need to dip it in something. And so they did. And so with pho, uh, your hoisin chili is on the side, and you dip your meatballs in it or the meat and then eat it because it's bland. Raw shaved beef is not very flavorful. And then, of course, nothing like a um, porridge with the meatballs in it. So we're going to get to the plates in a minute. After, let me know when everyone's got them, and then we, could, we can go with it. So then I was in Thailand. This is, I don't know, May or something like that. But these meatballs had, I think, um, I couldn't get the full story. I got a little bit of it. There's this holy trinity in Thailand. White pepper, coriander, cilantro, root, right, and garlic. Those three are pounded and used for countless different marinades, countless different ingredients, stir fries, as kind of this trinity of flavors that come together over and over. And that was in there. And then she said uh, white, w black pepper, though not white pepper, and then served as a whole meal. Now, over to the left, you see the, uh, the um, fish balls that were cut so decoratively. How many people have been to Thailand? I know a handful, right? Remember, the, everyone had the hot dogs on the street, the fried ones? So they take little Vienna sausages, split them. Well, what's a hot dog? Isn't it just a big, long dumpling of a sort? Long meatball? I mean, just, just saying. It's within scope. Or it's the gray area of scope. It's going with me, as we just saw in the presentation of the business meeting. So they cut that, and they fry it, and it opens up like a blossom of hot dogs, um, kind of an Interesting, odd, um, but it, it's popular there. So there's the fish ball and there's the fermented sausage on the bottom. Now, back to a dumpling that is essentially meatball wrapped in dough. So here we have shumai. Now, this is old school Hong Kong local cafe. The, the, the shumai itself is a fish paste, which is probably 40% starch, I would guess, based on it. It's really cheap, but it's what people like. It's kind of their junk food in a sense, right? And it's often served for some reason with these three things, right? You have that, you have the rice rolls, you have the sauce. But on the table, again, is a like a hoisin plum, a chili, a soy. So it's always this, it's kind of bland part of it. Dip it in something. And then there's new school shumai. So shumai means to bake and sell. That's what it kind of, yeah, I know, right? Turkey with cranberry, go figure. Why not? We make, we make crazy things with Asian food. Why can't they make crazy stuff with American food, right? Uh, so, so the thing about shumai, it means to bake and sell, right? Comes from, from the dim sum experience. And this one had the black garlic in it, same place. The cranberry one, really interesting, tasty. And then the shrimp with the abalone, there's something special about abalones in Chinese culture, especially the small one in cans premium product, right? And uh, I saw them all over the place, including on top of a dumpling. But then there was this black truffle shumai that I think was one of my favorite things I tasted on this trip because there was a surprise inside. And the surprise was a quail egg, right? Because you know the yolks never, they're really hard to get really hard anyway so that's always that's not a good thing in this case it was designed into it's from a place called Mot 32 Mot 32 actually has one in Vegas Singapore Dubai Hong Kong etc and it's named after yes the street in New York where Chinatown kind of sprung up from and evolved from over in Asia serving this quail egg black truffle right but oh my goodness it was it was pretty amazing. 80 Hong Kong dollars. I someone look it up. I don't remember what that was for two of them. Um, but it's an expensive meatball. Well, it's not just a meatball. It's an egg ball. I mean, there's a lot happening there. So just another example of looking at the form, looking at its function of the ingredient on the inside stuffed and the flavor and this just being served by itself. I don't think it needs much more than that. Now, this I had never seen before. How many people have had a dumpling sandwich? 
Now, I know we just said hot dogs are kind of like a dumpling. But I saw this, I'm like, that's a, that's a really good idea because it's not that different from some sausage in there. They're just wrapped with a wrapper instead. Um, so um, I, actually, it was a limited time offer. I can't read Chinese. I had someone read it for me. And, um, and it's something that they've been doing all sorts of different flavors, et cetera. But, oh, Chris, you're in the back. Perfect. Chris is serving a version of something like this at the Lee Can Key booth. Um, so go check his shumai dumpling. I'm going to try it because I haven't had it. Now, getting to the food you have in front of you. Shumai, I just said, means to bake and sell. It's a dumpling from China, mainly from southern China from dim sum houses, right? Everyone's, most people have had shumai. But sumai in Vietnam is a completely different thing. It's actually a meatball. So we go from meatballs to dumplings. This time they went from dumplings to meatballs. And so this is old, this is not something I invented. You go into any serious banh mi shop, even in the US, and you're gonna see this beautiful, um, well, I don't know if it's going to be beautiful the one you go to, but there's a possibility of a, of a beautiful meatball, and you'll see sumai there, down here. But it's from Dalat. Dalat is in cent South Central. Sounds odd if you're from LA. South Central Vietnam, and in that area, it's up in the hills. It's a much cooler area. It's where they grow a lot of the um, non-Asian produce, all the carrots and all those things for the hotels come from a lot. It's the romantic place for people to go for their weddings, et cetera. Everyone's got plates, correct? Just make sure, thank you. Um, and so from there, that's where this comes from. So much so in Hong Kong, just again, uh, back in December, this place, Black Sheep Restaurant Group, does some really high-end, beautiful stuff. Uh, I don't know if you've, Ty Dang from Chicago, from Hai Su, is working with them, consulting on their Asian concepts, and this is one of them. Um, but he wasn't, he didn't help them with this Bon Mi. So, and I'll tell why. So what, it comes from here, different chef, beautiful photo, but it was a fail in form and function and flavor. Why, looking at the photo? It was so disappointing. The bread, the bread is unevenly. unevenly cut. Oh, that's, well, actually, well, yeah, that too. Okay. <laughs> what else? Looking at that. Come on, you're R&D people. What's, what doesn't look right about that? Soggy. So what does that matter? I mean, traditionally, the thing is, if you have this, this dish, it's served in a banh mi. Or remember, banh mi means bread, not sandwich. Right? Bon is like cake, like crab cake, corn cake, black, whatever, cake. Um, it's, off, it's usually served as a dip that you eat with it, then you eat the rest with your other utensils, right? So that way it doesn't need to be bound. The one, those are the ones that you're about to eat on the right. And, um, but they didn't bind the sauce, and it was liquidy, and they put it in this bun, and it was just depressing. So don't let the dumplings be wet, chef, because I learned my lesson over there. Um, it was just horrible. It was just a shame because it had such capabilities. So let's get into tasting what's in front of you as the first thing. So what, don't open all of it. Pause. Open the black cup first. That is a Vietnamese sumai. And here's the formula. Not that you need, but just this is the working formula. Uh, so I just made these, what, two days ago, right? And on the inside, talk about functionality, flavor, form, and feel free just to go for it and eat it. There's a fork there for you if that's easier. I almost put chopsticks and I thought about what a freaking mess it would be <laughs> sitting here trying to balance and eat and so on. And I'm happy to send any of this to you, right? A recipe should be shared. So this should not be bouncy. It should have a little bite. Then it's coarse in texture. You taste inside, there's a lot of oyster sauce. There's fish sauce in the sauce, right? It's slightly sweet, almost lacking salt, deliberately. Because every time I eat it, every time I eat it, I'm like, oh. I'm like, well, maybe there's a reason for that. Like, just like, it's not one of those hit you in your face, etc. But to me, lots of flavor and it lingers. Right? When you look at those internal garnishes, you've got the flavor of the oyster sauce. You've got lots of black pepper in there. Um, you move over annatto oil. The reason it's that color in Vietnam, annatto oil is commonly used to give color and not flavor. 
just like we do for butter, cheddar cheese, et cetera, right? That's not, that's not a secret. But it's, um, so, and the, the I went Brunois, which I obviously spelled wrong now that I'm looking at it. Um, <laughs> Never said I was perfect. Uh, so we have the, I left it coarser. I've seen it chopped finer and I've seen it rougher. It just depends. What I find functionality, when you start building, and we've all, some of us have done this, a hamburger, some meat, um, let's say matrix, some meat mixture, some apparet, whatever language you want to use, uh, romantic or scientific. If you have too large of pieces and it's small, it's going to fall apart on you. Right, we all just functionality, like eh, these little things that we think about. So um, I want to hear descriptions. I want to hear wh what are you tasting, and remember, designed to be by itself, eating it often a fried egg, etc. Or this one is like what would go in a sandwich with your pickles, with all those other things. So uh, let's talk about it for a moment. What are you experiencing? Fatty pork. Fatty pork. Damn right. <laughs> Okay, I, I hear texture and hold your, raise your hands just so I can hear. I'd love to hear some. Yes, please. <coughs> umami, yeah, umami, right? I mean, it's it's there on every level, from the inside to the seasonings to the fish sauce to the tomato. You actually have that trifecta, right? You have peptides, you have nucleotides, you have glutamate, you have it all in one package. Something fermented like a kimchi. Something fermented like a kimchi, huh? Yeah, we have the chili garlic sauce in the in the base, which is the fermented chilies, and then the the fish sauce, right? And if you think about a lot of the winter kimchi, which probably is what we associate as most kimchi, the winter cabbage red one, often fish sauce or brine shrimp or oysters in it, right? So that makes sense. What else? Any other comments? What about its texture as a meatball? Soft. Yeah, soft. soft. Mushy. What about the texture of the meat? It's okay. You don't have to agree with him. Of course. Of course. <laughs> I hear people like, ah, yeah. Um, and it depends. There's some bite in there. It's a pork butt with a little bit, making sure it had a big fat cap on it, right? Plus, the amount of venado oil you add to it, as I remember, 3% isn't small. Right? That's a fair amount of oil to it where you get much more of that and that thing's going to fall apart on you. I didn't add egg to it, although some recipes had it. I want it to be tender. I want it to be easier to eat like that. So that's sample number one. Okay? Um, so samples number two. So this is a shop. Um, yeah, I, I didn't bring the striped one because I, I, I couldn't barely eat it myself. So, um, so during the new year, it just happened. So the Lunar New Year, Gong Si Fat Choi, right? Happy New Year to everyone. We just passed the Lunar New Year. And in Asia, especially in, in Sino-based Chinese cultures, it is the biggest festivity of the year. So we go back, we celebrate. And on the reunion night, the first night of, of the um, Chinese New Year, you always meet with your immediate family. And for some reason... I don't know why yet. I'm going to do some research projects on this, perhaps. Is um, it's always hot pot. It's become the thing. Hot pot, right, at the table with all these different fish balls and fried this and fried that, and everyone's just dipping it. That's the thing you serve. So I go to the store, and I kid you not, yeah, actually, there. That container is there because they're going to sell so much in the first couple days before the new year of people going in buying all these fish balls and all these other things to serve with hot pot. So I go there. I look at some of them, and, and then I bring some back to the house, and oh, boy, you, you don't want to eat this one. That one is a cheesy yeah, cheesy chicken. Yeah, that was a mistake for, me. <laughs> for thinking it might taste good, number one, um, to whoever designed it. But some people probably like it. I just didn't. But what I did like, there's a few that I brought back for you. So pumpkin, right? So you can pop those. Oh, wait, actually, before you do that, let me just go back to this just to show you the sauces because it's important how you taste them. So on your plate, three sauces. One, first one is like a hoisin, but it's fortified with plum sauce. And on your plate as well is this paper wrapped plum. Eat that last. That's your kind of way to cleanse your palate. And so these plums are a way to add licorice, right? An orange peel and add that flavor to it with normal plum sauce made by with the small salted plums. You have a chili garlic, which is some vinegar, chili garlic, simple. And then the chili crisp, but balanced with a bit acid to it. You can, if you can't tell which is which, you're at the wrong conference. <laughs> I'm just saying. So um, what I would, I would encourage you is 
start with the plain one, dodo. These are available here in the US frozen, actually. And that's just, a, and your fork's probably gonna be the easiest way. Taste the sauces, there's no formal way to do it. But the sweet one, the gloppy one, is probably the place to start. But you know what? If you're adults, you can do what you want. So you have one, the fish ball. Then you have the fish ball with pumpkin, which is at a fair percentage. And then you have the one that's speckled, has fish roe in it. So let's just take a moment to, to take a bite of a few of those. And while you're doing that, let me tell you a little bit about QQ. Has anyone ever heard that term before? T tell me what does it mean? It's like mochi texture, right? And you know, whenever you say it, you have to kind of like bounce like that. It's like mochi texture. QQ is a term that comes from Taiwan, actually. And it means like bouncy, but it, it, it's a lot larger than that. And check this out. I just discovered this yesterday. So here's the video. This place, Yongping, um, uses the Seito wolf herring fish, which is what they salt, water, fish, grind, and then just smack the thing, literally. Pick it up and throw it into the bowl. Pick it up and throw it into the bowl to smack that, to get that. I don't know if it's technically a motion. There's a meat scientist here. I'm not going to pretend to know exactly what it is. So, but this is what they do. This place, though, they're so bouncy, and we'll talk about bouncy good, bouncy bad, that when you bite it, it breaks into two. <coughs> don't like. It's just kind of an odd thing for me in my own cultural world, where this one you're going to see is still bouncy, but it's not, it doesn't break into four pieces when you bite it. But here, if you check out this video here, sorry, it wasn't really planning to video it. Um, as you walk in here, I go here for the curry me, this broth that you're going to see right there, really good coconut curry that you eat with the fish balls. And up here, you can see the fish balls, and I just discovered it. Look, here's the one you're about to eat. There's the pumpkin one. I didn't realize that they also buy them um, until this week. Go figure. And then you can see the pieces there. One ringgit is 20 cents right now, or 21 cents. And um, so you get a full plate of noodles, et cetera, for two bucks now or something like that, or just the fish cake themselves instead of the fish balls. Um, so what is that sensation? Well, um, somato sensory, right, is the touch feel part of how we perceive taste. And I thought, I just saw this in this neurogastronomy book. It's one of our readings over the past couple of weeks. What a phenomenal book. There's the, oh, I thought I had the QR code. Look up the uh, neurogastronomy. And the amyg amygdala, right, system. And this is important to what we're eating and the design of food, how it evolves, and why you have to consider these type of things. Think of the amy amygdala. <laughs> Amygdala, that's so hard to say that. Um, this is what, do we like something? Do we crave something? Oh, that's not good. That's rubbery. Oh, that's bouncy. I'm not into that. That is the way we sent, and usually that's such a culturally contextual thing. I can't wait, and I want real answers on this after you take a moment to eat all these. Your real opinion, like or not like, and I don't care, I didn't make them. I do care. I just don't have a preference if you like them or not. Uh, so I'd like to know about that because most people in America have a challenge with eating fish balls. First of all, they're like, I didn't know fish had balls. Two, they say, like, I don't like it too bouncy. It's like rubber. Everyone has their own thing to it. But why is that? It's because it's really connected into the system where you're like, oh, it makes you think of something that's overcooked or what have you, right? So has everyone had a chance to eat all three at this point? Okay, and dipping them in the different sauces. And then we gave you a little spoon if you want to taste the sauces by themselves, right? So let, let's talk about the plain fish ball first. Be, be candid. And now what is our barometer of would you buy it or is it, is it not offensive? You know, the express, how many times have you been in a tasting? And you say, oh, what's it like? Oh, it's not bad. <laughs> If I'm ever with you anywhere, please do that. <laughs> what does that even mean? It doesn't hurt? Like, what's not bad? So let's say, would you buy this as a, or would you eat this again? That's the one. Okay, so the fish ball, would you eat it again? Raise your hand. Put it down. How many would not eat it again? Okay, looks like eat it again, and then the rest we don't know. And so for those of you that would eat it again, why? Okay. Not on its own, so it's not, it wasn't offensive at all. I mean, it's just so it's not mild. bad. It's mild to its flavor. <laughs> but the texture, it's like chewing on a rubber bouncy ball. Yeah. 
Yeah. So when I, to me, you have it in a pot, you have it in some kind of a broth. You've got all these other things happening exactly. with it. Exactly. So it kind of gets lost in the, the sauce, per se. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, it's not that much. Barton? I have this issue where I don't know what it is. So it's a big well, it's a fish ball. We just told you that. <laughs> Dude, really? What about hot dogs? Yeah. Now, why are hot dogs? Yeah, okay. I know, I know. And, but move on to the next one, the pumpkin one. Uh, I'll get back to it. How many people like the pumpkin one? How many didn't like it? For those that didn't like the first one because of texture, do you like the pumpkin one's texture better? Yeah. Why? Not as bouncy. Not as bouncy. Not as, so one is the texture. What about moisture? Tell me about the experience of moisture eating up. Oh, who thought I would actually do this for a living? T tell me about the, the moisture of your pumpkin fish ball. I, I never thought I would, in high school I'd be doing this. This is insane. So Correct. A more pleasurable mastication process. <laughs> wow, you should be like a judge on a TV show. I love it. Okay, it's true. Plus, what I think about it. Go ahead. I think what to me, it's porous. It releases a little bit of moisture when you bite on it. It's got something to, or to me, it's closer to a hot dog or something like that, where it's not just break, but it's got some oomph to it. Plus, it's sweet. Yes. Like a scrambled egg. The American palette is pretty happy with. And I thought the color was just inviting versus the color of the, the white fish ball. You know, like what is the color was inviting. Yeah. Sure. Dig it. What else? Anyone in the back? Anyone? Um, does it have eggs? I don't know. Let's find out. I brought packages just in case you wanted to. Um, and you know what? This is what's kind of wild uh, over there, right? Surimi, 57%. Pumpkin, 26%. Start, you got to put your percentages of your formulas. How does that suck, right? Um, that's a, I can really defend this. Uh, palm oil, 3%. Salt and flavor enhancer, MSG, right, E621. E and it's only 0.8% sugar, so it's mostly from the pumpkin. Yeah, but uh, pretty clean, actually. I mean, relatively to what, <laughs> what's in some things. Yeah, so, um, okay. So bounce, so on. But let's get back to uh, what else? To the last one, the one with the fish row. What do you think of that? You like that? I thought that. Yeah, that's the okay. How many people like the one with the fish row in it? And how many down? Uh, how many? Do, <laughs> how many didn't like it? I should have used some Slido or something fancy, I guess. <laughs> um, so why is that? Why did it seem like people? I saw like more emotional experiences from people as they ate that. And what you just said, when I asked that question, it was a completely different reaction on your faces. Why? I heard someone say surprise, like. Surprise, yeah. Surprise. Right? There's, a, there's, a, there's some surprise inside there. And when you bite, you're like, oh. And then you're like, oh, oh. <laughs> right? You get like layers of textures, the bounce. And each thing, it, it evolves as you eat it, which I think is you know, in, in, um, typical. Emblematic, emblematic of Vietnamese food often, right? Where there's layers and things are happening as it, as it unfolds, as you chew it. It's this textural experience as you go through it. So yeah, that's about bounce. Let's talk a little bit more about dumplings. Oh my goodness, what shape do you want? Now this is a grilled dumpling. They actually work, boil them first. Same thing, by the way, with the Vietnamese meatball where any meatball, not any meatball, meatballs you're gonna put on a stick Maybe this is obvious. Don't put it in raw. Yeah. <laughs> I knew someone's tried it before. Um, right? Uh, steam them. Same thing for the tomato sauce. And I did that deliberately, seriously, though, not just for shape. But besides setting the shape, I think the juice flavor coming out of a meatball raw into a tomato sauce is very different than steaming till they're fully cooked, then dropping it in, including that juice. Completely how we layer this how we deliberately craft that is a big difference. Um, then here, well, I'll talk about each one of these in a moment. So not all dumpling wrappers are created equal. So think about that, right? I mean, you have what we think typical, wheat-based, 
But then tapioca pearls. Anyone that had dumplings made with tapioca pearl outside? Couple, right? Thai, we'll go with that in a moment. Rice paper can be used as a dumpling wrapper, no question. Saw someone just on some silly TikTok thing the other day. Take two of them, put them together, cut it in a square, then um, deep fried it, puffed up, and then he punctured a hole and piped in it. Kind of a cool idea, actually. Um, and then there's, wow, something wrong, uh, of soybean sheet, which I'll talk about. This one was at that same dim sum place with the monster meatball. And that one is molten salted egg yolk. And it wasn't even a wrapper. It was some d like lo loose dough on the outside, taro, with this molten egg yolk, this little puffed rice on it. And then the grilled one over there, which was, I think, clever. This. I was going to make this for you, but sorry, it was just way too much work in all candor. <laughs> so um, one of my favorite dishes in Thailand, like after 30 plus years, that's the one. So they take the tapioca, soak them. They may color it with bl blue pea flour or dragon fruit or something like that. And then you mash it. Then you fill it up with this mixture. The mixture that you see there is pork. Lots of palm sugar, roasted peanuts, lots of fish sauce, cooked down into this just like pork candy. That goes inside, then it's steamed, but not as if that's not enough. Then you go down to the end, and it's served in the lettuce leaf with fried garlic on top. And then you snack on always, you snack on, there's no always in food, usually. Um, you snack on a little chili padi, the little teeny bird's eye chilies as you eat these. And so you go back and forth with that phenomenal thing. You need to try those next time you see it at a Thai restaurant. So I'm back in, wow, that's me. Um, I'm back in um, Malaysia, and there's something called Yang Tao Fu on the right. Yang Tao Fu is a stuffed bean curd, and it's almost always fish paste. So they make the fish paste, and you stuff it in okra, right? They call them ladies' fingers. You stuff it inside chilies. You stuff it in tofu. You even take tofu. You've ever seen those square tofu puffs? Some of you have, right? You cut that in half, you flip it inside out, so that spongy inside goes on the outside, and then you stuff it with fish cake and you deep fry it. Oh, fuck, so good. I was going to make that for you. I didn't care how much it worked, and I was going to do it with pork, but then I found I couldn't have a deep fryer. I was literally going to bring a deep fryer and make them for you because they're so good. And serve with that plum sauce and that chili sauce together. The crunch, incredible. It's kind of a dumpling. But there's one that I just had. Okay, it's my first morning in Malanka. I came for dim sum, and um, holy, mm, look at this. So this is a dumpling of sorts. It's um, fuchok, or the what some the Japanese call yuba, or soybean sheet wrapped around some. It's usually a shrimp paste, but this one actually has um, shrimp. And usually a fish paste. Usually a fish paste. Oh my goodness. You see how crackly? Hear that? It is so crispy, so damn good. That's an example of another dumpling. So, you, Yuba, you had it before, right? And you know how they make it, right? Just heat soy milk, peel off, and dry. They sell them now in um, uh, H Mart. H Mart, yeah. And they also have the rolls for the. Frozen stuff with the shrimp and the shrimp paste. Yeah. yeah, that was just, it was so crispy and so light and so delicious. Okay. Um, then there's another way of evolving something, being inspired and saying, well, I'm going to do a black cod dumpling, but I'll make the dough wrapper black. Just to, it has nothing to do with the cod, right? It was just, I thought, a clever way and just a beautiful dumpling served with a chili oil type of side, a chili sauce on the side, because in the inside it's cod. You can imagine it's kind of like the fish ball. There's not a ton of flavor, um, but letting people dip it in itself, and that was 95, so it was even... Um, uh, yeah, it is gold leaf. Yeah, it was, um, yeah, th this is, well, of some, something gold. <laughs> Don't know, chef. Uh, um, now, mandu, Korean dumplings. How many people have had Korean dumplings, right? What would you say in general is unique about a Korean dumpling? Decorative. Decorative? Okay. Oh, like how they're folded, the pleated? Okay. I've never noticed, but sure. I mean, look. What about the wrapper? Thicker. Who said that? Thicker, right? Almost always thicker, even so much where they just take the rice, right? The cakes, what, what is it called? The to, to bulk, the rice cake. Yeah. To, um, just not, texturally for me, like that went so far where it's, it's like just 
unless they're soft, but when they're really firm, it's just not, not a thing. So just quick nod, Korea, because they deserve it, because there's some really good food there. This I just discovered. I was out at the, the Global Marketing Conference for the Walnut Board, and the folks from Japan made a dumpling like this, and I'd never saw it before. I'm like, shh. That's really clever. Uh, and you can see how it's assembled. I didn't, obviously didn't make this. And that one they even colored. But it's really interesting to see how to take one dumpling, line it up, roll it up, and you can like brown it, then cover it. And that was the other one I was going to make. Then I also had a reality check of, do you see how many people are in this room? Browning dumplings would have been a challenge. But here, what I wanted to bring up as well is this ratio. And this is from Chopstick Chronicle. I didn't come up with this. I thought it was an interesting way of looking at it. Of you know, soy sauce and rice vinegar, soy sauce and oil, soy sauce, rice vinegar, chili oil. Just this building, which is the one that you're tasting there, similar. But that, the chu chow oil, also has fried garlic, also has shallots, also has a lot more to it than just the chili oil. And it seemed appropriate, and I hope it tasted good. Another rose dumpling, only made at one restaurant in Hoi An, um, and called, oh, that's going to keep going, called White Rose. And um, they put this little teeny piece of pork. It's mostly tapioca with some rice flour, so it has that bounce to it. Really simple, really small. And then they also serve this nacho. And I kid you not, it's fried wontons with like a mango salsa on it with tomatoes. You look at it like some American was here and just made this with you one day. I know they did. <laughs> it's just bizarre. But this family makes it and sells it to everyone across Hoi An. That's kind of their thing, and they've, they've held on to it. Now, let's get into a little bit and wrap up with some innovative things, I think. So this I just saw in Hong Kong as well. Wouldn't it be great to go buy fresh dumplings from a shop? I mean, where could you, like, the, I, I have frozen dumplings in my refrigerator, whether it be Ling Ling Ajinomoto or whether it be, I'm, I wouldn't even say guilty. Yeah, I always have them. I need something quick to eat. They're fantastic. But it's not a fresh dumpling, right? There's something about kind of, it's just a different texture. And so this was just super cool. I thought it was a beautiful way. And the way that they illustrate the, the fillings, the way it's displayed, it's opened, it's bursting out. I thought it was just a beautiful example. Now, um, soup dumplings. Has anyone tried these ones? What do you think? Pretty damn good. I haven't tried the pho, this one, but the other ones. And it is like a meatball because it is um, you know, extruded. Obviously, it's been bound up a little bit more for, for obvious reasons. These ones were pretty good. Um, a uh, close friend of mine, I'm actually, we're opening in June the largest restaurant in the Denver airport. I'm helping them. We're going to have these French onion stoop dumplings on the left. They were on the menu 13 years ago, still on their menu at their three locations, and we're opening one at the airport. And on the bite, General Cho's, not Sao, General, General Cho's soup dumpling, and it's basically that stir fry in a dumpling. So I think soup dumplings have seeming to have, or dumplings in general. Mike, what do you think? Are, are dumplings having a moment? Sure, yeah. Yes, okay, Mike says they're having a moment, but they're everywhere. I mean, soup dumplings, yeah. Soup dumplings especially. Why is that? Why do you think soup dumplings are a thing? Mike, let's stick with you for a moment. <laughs> I mean, I think anything experiential these days is so popular. So Something experiential. Yeah, with TikTok and videos and, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, with designing food to make it look good on camera. Yes, Stephen. Americans know soup. Americans know soup. Okay. Fair enough. Anyone else? Why soup dumplings? Texturally interesting. You have both the liquid and the solid at the same time. Yep, right. Precarious as it may be, right? Uh, okay. People don't know how to make them. Great point, right? This is something still beyond the, uh, and it's true, right? To get that ratio right. And do you make a meatball and put in a cube of gelled stock, or do you grind this gelled stock into the meatball? We have a vote. How many people would grind it into the meatball? How many have made a soup dumpling before? OK, so all four, eight of you. Um, do you grind it into the meat? I chopped it and like, folded it in. Chopped it and folded it in. Yeah. OK. OK. Yeah, th there they actually put a little cube separate, so you actually have a solid mass with that. I mean, there's a bunch of ways to do it. I just thought that was an interesting example. Now, get ready soon to a 7-Eleven near you. Right? Pork stomach shumai. I'm sure it's coming. 
this is real, right? This is, this is um, yeah. And uh, the whole different assortment, whether it be meatballs, shumai, on a stick, or that one, it's hard to read. I know I took a ter terrible picture. That one up there, that is chicken cartilage meatballs, because who would have thought you were waiting for that to come out as well? Um, that's that little, that's good actually. Chicken cartilage can be really good. Now, here's a dumpling you're never going to expect to see. That's a dumpling mango cake. That's real. I mean, that, I didn't make this stuff up. I, mean, I just took that picture a couple weeks ago or whatever. I guess it's two months now. Uh, mango filling, moose cake, and a white peach filling was the one that looks like hargau. And so dumplings um, in every form, every shape, every size. I thought that was kind of interesting and just humorous at that. So I'm going to end with just a couple things. Make sure to go have that. You want a good read. Now, does anyone know who Fuchsia Dunlap is on the right? Tien is the chef on the left. Fuchsia Dunlap is a prolific writer. She moved to Sichuan years back, learned Chinese, has written, I don't know, four or five books or something like that. Wonderful woman. And this is a history of China through food. It's a phenomenal read. So it's a book that you might want to check out. I thought it was pretty special. Oh, okay. Thank you. Th thank you. I hope that met your expectation. Probably didn't. It was an unknown thing, right? But I hope you enjoyed it nonetheless. Have a great day. Anything I can do, you know how to reach out to me.